Well, now, you may think of Dana Andrews as a uh, motion picture stage and television star, but he's sitting here telling me how to get rich in real estate. I, <laughs> you, you have become rich in real estate and it's because it's interesting that you said to me you saw that this couldn't last forever, meaning show business, acting, and so forth. So, Well, I did, and it certainly wasn't going to last. It doesn't last forever, and, and on top of which, I was noticing that a tremendous percentage of the, what I was making was going to the government. Yeah. And so I figured there must be some way to uh, keep it from going all in taxes. And so I found out what they are, and businessmen all do it. It's just uh, you, you invest, in the, and the government is delighted to have you invest because it helps the economy. Yeah. And then instead of paying it to the government, you invest it yeah. in, in something that uh, you have your name on, and that helps. Let's go back now. Before you got rich, you were uh, born and raised in Texas. Your father was a minister. As a matter of fact, my father was very definitely connected with the state of Florida. Really? Yeah, Senator Andrews in Florida is my cousin. Really? Yeah, and he was my father's cousin, so he's the second cousin of mine. I had a lot of relatives here, and, and I, but I was born in Mississippi. Oh. And uh, a few years ago, I was made Mississippian of the Year, and they had down there in Coventry County, they had Dana Andrews days, and Mary and I drove in a 39 Cadillac, which is our, it just happened, was our, our wedding anniversary of the 39 Cadillac. 20,000 people in a parade. Really? Dana. Isn't that something? That's wonderful. Yeah, Mount Olive, Seminary, Collins, and uh, one other. And they, we drove through these four little towns, and the mayors were all out, and they had school out on Friday. That's really, you know, it made me feel very humble. That's fair. Here, these little towns are, are recognizing one of their own. And uh, Well, really, but so often people in your position, uh, we remember you, but you don't remember us. I mean, us, the little people that we leave behind in those small towns. Uh, I was hearing about Ed McMahon, was still friends with people he grew up with and goes back, his friend of his owns a hardware in Iowa, mm -hmm. and he went there. Quite often people who reach stardom, as you did and have, forget the past. And the no, people. I didn't do that. I, as a matter of fact, a lot of my friends that I knew in, in Texas, that's where I really grew up, and yeah. the way I left Texas to go out to California to get into pictures, I used to go back and visit them. and. Of course, I had quite a lot of people that were in my own family. I was one of 13 children. Really? <laughs> yeah. Steve Forrest. You have a my, brother? Yeah, he's, he's the youngest one. He's the only other actor. But they were mostly educators because we, the minister doesn't make any money. So my father saw very early after sending the oldest one to Baylor, which is a, uh, although it's a Baptist college, uh, is you still have to pay tuition. And uh, oh. he wasn't going to be able with, with all these boys to pay that tuition. So he moved and got a pastorate in Huntsville, Texas, which was the uh, state uh, university, that teacher's college. So four or five of the boys all and, and, and the daughter all became teachers. <laughs> but you were telling I me... I skipped that. I didn't think I'm a teacher. <laughs> you were a business manager for what, a furniture company in Austin. Yeah, office furniture and printing. Well, what would you do? Wake up one morning and say, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to be an actor. Well, when I was leaving college, there was a Dr. Charles O. Stewart who directed me in a number of plays in the Sam Houston State Teacher's College. And as I was leaving, he said, I know you're going into the business world, Carver. That's my name uh, when I was younger. It's Car Dana is my second name. It's a Christian name, but it's the second one. He said, uh, but one of these days, I'm sure that you're going to uh, get, rid get rid of that. You'll be doing something else. And he said, I suggest you think about uh, acting. He said, I've directed you in a few plays. And he says, I think you have quite a talent for that. So I, you might think about that. Hmm. So I was, uh, before I was 21, I was making in salaries about what you would say was about $1,000 a month today, which would then was only about $200 a month yeah. or something like that. And what I realized that uh, that was, uh, that, that I was getting older and I, I didn't want to be a bookkeeper. If I became president of the United States Steel, I wouldn't like it. So I said, what are you going to do? And I remembered what Dr. Stewart told me. So I gave my notice. And I had money, I had what money I'd saved. I gave a party for all my friends and hired an orchestra and had a dance and <laughs> <laughs> it all and a hitchhike to California. What year in now? In 1929. Uh, okay. I, well, I was in the change of the, into 30, I arrived there in 1930. And uh, the Depression was on, and really? believe me, there was uh, the best job I could get was driving a school bus for $10 a week. And I lived on that for quite a few months. But then slowly worked my way into working in a filling station, and then I began uh, studying, taking singing lessons with a local fellow, and that merged into uh, two fellows who were in, 
uh, entrepreneurs that they decided they were going to finance me and I was going to become uh, a singer because they, Bing Crosby was just becoming <laughs> making a lot of money at that time. Okay. So they paid me uh, seventy dollars a month, and my way was to, my business was to find out how to get into motion pictures. So I started studying and I learned five complete operatic roles because Nelson Eddy and Lawrence Tibbet yeah. made pictures and that, yeah. was the, that was the coming thing. You know, like television came in and a lot of people said, you're going to die and it ain't dead. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, so I learned these five, opera, uh, five complete roles and I then had a, uh, Russ Colombo had a brother named John Colombo and he, I auditioned with him and he said, after the audition, he said, well, you've got a pretty good boy, but if you go into the Met, and you got a long way to go, and you see you, you get stuck in the chorus. Maybe you don't get to sing any of those Curious arias. You, you, yeah, you, you don't get to sing any of those <laughs> arias. You just sing with the chorus. Nobody will ever know you. He said, "Why don't you go to one of these little theaters around in the area?" And he said, "There, some of them are pretty good, and the studios send their talent scouts around to these places." So I scouted around, and I found one that I thought was first class, and that was the Pasadena Community Playhouse, which the people of Pasadena supported. Mm -hmm. And not only did they support it with money, they supported it with their attendance. They came to yeah. see the plays, and they were very interested in them, and, and, uh, and it gave you a feeling that you were doing something important for the community there. And Gilmore Brown, who was the uh, director of it, was really dedicated to the theater, and he wasn't trying to make a big thing out of himself. He was trying to make the theater for these people, and we did, he did a complete Shakespeare uh, festival to the number oh, of yeah. that Everything yeah. that, ever, uh, that Shakespeare ever wrote, they did at the Playhouse yeah, one time or another. And then he did uh, Winning of the Southwest with Maxwell Anderson and various other ones. And Anyway, I did 25 plays there, and I had fallen in love with uh, Mary Todd, who was at the Playhouse in the school, which I couldn't afford. And I've been married to her now for 40 years. And uh, I told her, and we were engaged, and I said, I've given it nine years now, and that's enough. I can't just spend my life wanting something. I'm going to have to go back to business and do something and doing this. With tears in her eyes, she said, no, you can't do that. You're, you know, you're just coming along, just you're getting better and better all the time. And so I did one more play, and that one did it. Really? One play, and it's one of the lesser parts that I played. Oh, that was a nice little part. It was a Zoe Aikens had written a play about Marie Dressler, you know, the old sure. character actress, yeah. called O oh, Evening Star. Hmm. And Florence Bates uh, played that, and I was given, and I had Victor Joy's white tie and tails, and I looked pretty <laughs> good, you know. And, uh, but I was working for those two fellows in an oil business over in Van Nuys, and I had to get home. I had a child whose mother died in childbirth, my first wife. And, so I, I just got threw off the white tie and tail and got home and an agent came down there that night and wanted to see me and I wasn't there and he left a note, called me. So I asked Victor Jory and Robert Preston who had already been in pictures in a few a year or so. And they ever heard of this agent? They hadn't, so I thought it was a joke and I just didn't do anything. Well he found my number and called me. He said, Why didn't you call me? And I said, Well, I thought maybe somebody was trying to pull my leg. Yeah. And he said, Well no, you come down and talk to me. So I took the fellows that were helping me, naturally. Your and investors. Down there. Yeah. And we went down, and uh, he, my agent, uh, the, 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 uh, my godfather, or whatever you want to call it, he, uh, we went out and had a little chat, chat, and he said, well, he says you can cancel it if he doesn't get your job in four months. And so mm -hmm. what's, what's, what, can, what can you lose? Went in and signed it, and in 15 minutes, I was in Sam Goldwyn's vice president's office, who was a friend of his from St. Louis from years back. He had discovered Fred and Adele Astaire and Gene sure. Arthur and Eddie Dowling. And uh, so he was well known, but I just didn't know him and nobody knew him in Hollywood because he didn't operate there. So I was there and this man said, well, Lou, I know that you uh, have a pretty good eye for these people. He said, let's make a test. So I made a test and Mary was sitting on one side of Sam Golden and I was sitting on the other and we looked at the test and <laughs> Golden said, well, young man, welcome to Golden. <laughs> so, uh, now, what year was that, 39? That was 39, yeah. and uh, after Mary's family had the engraved in invitations to come to the wedding, I got a call, and it said, let your hair and your beard grow. You're going to be in the Westerner. That was in the fall of 1939. And, uh, and so I was uh, uh, in the Westerner. I was married with this rough beard, you know, and yeah. long hair. And the Santa Monica outlook felt compelled to put, Mr. Andrews is an actor, note the beard. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Goldwyn, while I was doing the Westerner, and was out in Tucson, 
uh, uh, this agent had turned me over to the William Morris agency because he felt that he ne needed more power than he mm -hmm. had in Hollywood to, to do something with me. So uh, uh, while I was in uh, Tucson, I got a call and said, well, uh, Goldwyn wants to sell half your contract to Fox. And I said, well, is that good or bad? And he said, well, it's probably good because there they have B pictures and you can do work pictures. Goldwyn doesn't make very many pictures. And when Goldwyn didn't want to pay me 40 weeks a year, you know, which right. he had to do with the contract. So anyway, that's why he did it. And so, consequently, immediately, I went to work at Fox and B Pictures and learned the business in, in those and go back and work for Goldwyn and A Pictures. And then pretty soon, the Purple Heart made me a star and I did Laura and so on. And you say now that. Now, 72 pictures. <laughs> but you say that made me a star. What, what was that process? How long was that? It's Overnight? the returns of the uh, of the picture and the comments from the exhibitors. Was they that say, almost yeah. overnight? Well, I was making the Purple Heart. Now this is along in, in uh, 1945, right. and uh, uh, making the, the Purple Heart. And Lewis Milestone, who was the director, had directed me in a picture that Goldwyn had made uh, called the North Star, which was uh, a mm -hmm. picture about Russia when they were our friends. Mm -hmm. If you remember, it was in Finland. Where it took place. No, no, it was in, in, it was in <coughs> Russia. It, oh, okay. it was in Russia. The North Star was the name of the village, right. and uh, the song written about it was written by uh, uh, Ira Gershwin and, and Copeland. You never had to answer no. Hollywood Ten questions about making. No, no, I, no. Goldwyn didn't either. Oh, but okay. uh, but but we were their friends then. You see, yes, they of course. became the enemy after that, and uh, so. Uh, Let's see, where was I? Well, you were making the, uh, you started, you were making Purple Heart. Oh, the making of the Purple Heart, and Milestone had done that, and he was right. a very good friend of mine. So I was going home one night, and he, had, he said, Dan, come over here, I have to take this home with you and read it. He said, uh, Preminger's going to make a picture of this, and he wants me to do it, but he said, I have other things. And uh, he said, if you can do this, if you can get this, this will make a star of you. Well, what, the picture he was making is what made a star of me, which was ironic. But I read it, and I wanted to get it, no chance. Uh, we were going to put Hodiak in it, because he had just done a picture with two little bank head right. and a lifeboat. And uh, so uh, anyway, I, I liked it, but I couldn't get it. Preminger said, no, Janik wants that. Now, um, the, the way this worked, it was just one of those things that happened. I'd, right after that, I was doing Wing and a Prayer with uh, Don Amici. And Zanuck called me and said, Dan, I know you don't like these things, but the government wants us to make them because it keeps, you, uh, <laughs> uh, keeps the services happy. Yeah. And so he said, don't give me any trouble. So I have to wait and do it. Anyway, the reason why I mention that is because one day, when I had a day off, I was called in to come and look at the fact that they had taxied 20 planes from Santa Monica up Pico Boulevard to be on a fake deck there of this aircraft carrier. Yeah. And there was a little boy there that wanted to see those planes. This is now president of 20th Century Fox. His name is <laughs> Dickie Zanuck. Really? And, and Darrell said, Virginia, I don't want him out there alone, so you go with him. Well, she was with him. So I had met her at the Milestones party. They gave her a nice party. And so we were friends, and we were talking and talking. And pretty soon she said, Dan, I'd like to ask you a question. So I was with Darrell when he bought half your contract with Goldwyn, and I've seen your, your picture with Renoir, you know, the swamp water and a few pictures, and, and the, the, the uh, the uh, Oxbow incident, and you know, you're a good actor, but uh, I never thought of you as a leading man. Mm. And, and uh, I've been talking to you now for an hour or so, and, uh, and I, something has happened to you. What, what's changed you? And I just laughed, and she said, Don't laugh, I'm serious. And she said, Well, no, I, uh, uh, she, what is it you want to know? And she said, Well, you're a different person, something has happened. And I said, when, I, when you're in a picture and you're the star, you get the right parts. You say the right things. Yeah. I can't, in Crash Top, I can't take Tyrone Power's girl away from him because it says it's his girl. That's, right. and that's what you're, you're going for the story. And, uh, and I elaborated on that. She said, you're really serious about it? I said, of course. It's as simple as that. So that was Saturday, and Monday morning I got a call from Preminger, and his thick accent, he said, Donna, I don't know what happened, but you got the part. <laughs> in Laura. Except in Laura, and yeah. that was it, and that's the one that... And most, that's the one that turned one, the part. Yeah, yeah, so then you became a star, and you were famous. Now, let's shift ahead to your problems with alcohol. And Are you a member of Alcoholics Anonymous? I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, but it didn't seem to work with me. Really? Yeah, because, well, you know, it's partly religious, although it isn't a religious yeah. organization, but... It works with an awful lot of people, but it just didn't seem to work with me. And uh, the thing that did work with me was uh, 
that I almost died from uh, the, the going into convulsions or really? you know. And in other words, it, it, and I've learned a great deal about it, which I now go out and make speeches for the National Council. This is the number one disease problem in the United States. It's not irresponsible uh, sort of a right. thing. It's a disease, and the IRS allows complete deductions, and the large companies like General Motors and, and companies like this, they have a plan which they, uh, they can buy insurance for it because of it being, of it being the disease. And they'll go to the vice president and say, look, we know you've got a problem. Hmm. Now you go and get it taken care of and we'll pay for it and we'll give your wife money. But there need. wasn't that liberal attitude about it when you had the problem. No, the that, that, that has come up yeah. since. Now all yeah. these things, well, one of the things they found out, which will, might surprise you, it might surprise people listening to this program. And that is, uh, because of the money that has been um, afforded to people that they can afford to find out, facts about alcoholism, which they didn't know before. There is, among the general population of Caucasians, uh, uh, out of 100 million drinkers, 10%, consistently, 10% become alcoholic. Really? In all walks of life, up and down, and in the middle, 10%. So this is very interesting. And so they tried it on a different type of physique, like an Indian. 25%, consistently, 25%. Now this only indicates at this point, this is what they know, that it is a certain percentage become alcoholic. Hmm. And one doctor has already said that he believes that he is about to be able to identify a substance in the blood which causes a person to be unable to resist the desire for alcohol after he's been subjected to so it. So all the kinds of things that we might imagine would have led you to drink, uh, instant success, not instant, but seemingly instant success, a lot of money, a lot of fame, prestige, probably didn't have anything to do with it. You would have had the same No, problem. and I can give you, I'll give you some very conclusive proof on that. I okay. spent uh, probably a couple of hundred thousand dollars with psychiatrists and, the, and I ended up with the president of the American Psychiatric Association who ended up by saying, Dana, I'll be damned if I can see anything that you might be hiding that's causing you to drink to get rid of it. Really? Why do you think so? And I said, well, it makes me feel good and I like to feel good. And he said, that's about as good an answer as I can give you. <laughs> and that's all that's... Good. Well, he, no, well, before he retired and before the man who sent me to him retired, they both wouldn't take alcoholics anymore because they realized that they weren't doing them any good at all. Hmm. Other, they might do them good some in other ways, but they weren't helping the alcoholism. And that, of course, is the, uh, the thing that they found out now is that it's a certain percentage of the people. Now, when knowing this, this is going to help them a great deal. But one of the things that we all have to remember is it is not irresponsible. It is all be not because they don't give a damn. It is because that if they drink, now you see, when I stopped drinking, I was determined that I was going to get it out of my system, and then yeah. I never had, I don't have the problem anymore. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, but I don't take any drinks, yeah. because if I did, I would suddenly become very heavily yeah. desirous of uh, yeah. having a drink. I was talking with your, uh, your co-star, with the, the play here, Sylvia Sidney, about growing older, and I, as a man, I want to talk to you about being a young, handsome, leading man, if there's a, if you, if, and I was going to ask you if that was part of the drinking. Growing out of that and missing being the male lead, the romantic lead. If no, no, no. no, no. Hair getting I'm a very happy. happy man. You're looking at one of the happiest men you ever saw. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I have three children, three grandchildren. My wife loves me, and I'm crazy about her. My friends are uh, numerous, and we. I just. Uh, the only thing I don't really like is I'm getting a little too old to sail the size boat that. I <laughs> I had just sold the, the last boat we had was the Saga 9, and the reason for that was that was the ninth boat that I had owned since I got interested in sailing. But you still act. I mean, you don't have to do it for a living. Oh, yes, but, you know, I'm 72 years old now, and you don't get those young, handsome, leading men parts that you do. But I, I do like to get, you know, nice, mature, uh, intelligent parts, and yeah. that's what uh, well, this part. This part is uh, one that's based on a Baptist minister who was the father of the man who wrote the play. Really? Yeah, he, we were talking and, uh, and, and he said, Osborne said, I, I, I was talking about his family and I said, well, my father was a Baptist minister and he said, shake, so was mine. I'll be doing. <laughs> Going back a minute to Laura, I've read Jean Tierney's book, which is a fascinating book about her almost marrying John, John Kennedy, among other yeah. uh, affairs she had. But, do you keep in touch with her? She, I call her, she lives in Houston, and she's married to a man by the name of Lee, and uh, uh, when they did, um, uh, my wife and I were doing a, a, a play in, in Minneapolis, and they were going to do uh, This Is Your Life, yeah. and of course I didn't know anything about it, but she was getting all these things together and calling the people, and she called uh, about Jean Tierney to see if she could come, because she had done four, I've done four pictures with her, 
And uh, the doctor said no, he didn't think so. Yeah. She's, she's all right, except they don't want to take any chances because a couple of times well, she's had sort of relapses into something that, I don't know exactly what it was, but she was at the Dana, after clinic for a while. all your years in the business, do you have any idea why some movies become classics? What, what it is in them that makes them great movies? Well, that's a very difficult question. I, I know that it, they, they're uh, eternal truths in them that, that apply to various ages and uh, various, to, to all people, more than just something that applies to a particular group or a very particular interest, and that have uh, the qualities that, uh, depiction of the qualities that we admire and to see them, uh, the problems of life, overcome by other humans just like yourself. And uh, a great picture like the Oxbow Incident, for instance, didn't get any success at all. Uh, really? And the reason, well, the reason That's for the that is yeah. the type, what the picture is about is the, the justice and the administration of justice and the importance of giving the pers person a fair trial in a court. Not a kangaroo court, but a court of, of your peers. Mm -hmm. And uh, consequently, though, it was made as a Western. It was written as a Western by Walter Van Tilburg Clark. And uh, it, if it hadn't been for Bill Wellman, it never would have been made because Daryl Zonick told him, it's a, this thing's a dog, it'll die. People won't, it, it did. They closed it at the ground of Chinese in a week. Really? And the reason for it is the people who want to see a Western don't want to see that kind of a picture, and the people who want to see that kind of picture don't want to see a Western. That's right. So you got it, you lost them to both counts, so you, nobody came. And that's the reason why. But a picture that is about, uh, Sex and love, of course, that appeals to almost everybody, even people who are too old to be active in it. Why they what's, still are interested. Well, in what's it. Mornings at Seven about? Mornings at Seven is uh, it's very interesting. The the man who uh, is rather responsible for it being uh, brought out of the trunk uh, said he saw it as an English as a restoration play, oh. but brought up to a, a certain uh, more up to date. And he, he wanted to try it, and he, he did it out in uh, someplace, Indiana or someplace. And uh, it was quite successful. And so he tried to get a New York producer to do it, and the New York said, oh, no, that thing will die. And he, he couldn't uh, get any, so he found a couple of women that really? had some money, and they put up the money, and it's the biggest theater on Broadway. It has been for a long, long time. Consequently, everybody wants to know, what is there about this play? Well, it has qualities that are really a little difficult to define. But one of them, of course, is the um, putting in a humorous form those things which we all do, and, and certainly uh, uh, we observe, we will say, rather than being that way ourselves, that we repeat common, banal sort of things that don't have uh, right. much meaning and as if it's very important, you know, and do it over and over again. And yet they're still human beings, just like everybody else. But there is, uh, my wife was at the opening night, one of, heard one woman say, they keep saying the same thing over and over again. They sound like a bunch of morons. Well, <laughs> that's exactly what the man intended. But they didn't appreciate what he was well, doing. It's too bad no, it's well. a very clever play, really. And, it's, uh, and, and I, I think that the public is just, I saw it twice in New York, and both times, it was, I think the second time, even more than the first, where oh, they were just, just sit there. Well, people can see it at the Theater of Performing Arts and see Dan. You do, do you play a 72-year-old man? Or you oh, yes, yeah. I'm, I play a, a very uh, a pompous, uh, semi-profound yeah. sort of a fellow who's yeah. trying to, to convince a man who probably knows more than he does. I'm trying to convince him. Uh, uh, settle his mind about where he is right. because he's always wanting to know where he is. Well, being with you for these few minutes, I, the phrase comes to mind, life begins at 72, Dane, I, I think it's... I, I think so. I, I certainly uh, have nothing to look forward to but happiness, I can tell you that. And, and that keeps you uh, very healthy, I think. That's I right. haven't got a thing wrong with it. I haven't had an illness for, for, since I stopped drinking. Good for you. Okay. Congratulations, Dana. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. We'll be right back.
Well, Dane Andrews, thanks very much. We'll look for you at the Parker Playhouse in mornings at 7. I, I th when I see you, I think life begins at 72, Dana. Well, I, I agree with you. Mine, mine's got a long way to go yet. <laughs> That's great. Good being with you. We'll be right back.